Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss an update. Leave a comment below to help grow the channel, and don't forget to smash the like button. Okay, lecture 94, the Doppler effect. So today we're going to talk about uh, a particular effect that has to do with a moving source of waves. It could be sound waves, it could be light as well. It could be any kind of wave, really. Um, normally, if we have a, an object radiating, right, and it's not moving, and maybe our observer is standing over here somewhere, right? As time goes on, they're going to see wave fronts approach them, right? The wavelength, right, is just this distance right here, lambda naught. And this observer will observe a frequency given by lambda naught times nu naught equals c, where c is the wave speed, okay? Could be, I know we usually use it for the speed of light, and that's fine, but you can also use it for the speed of any wave, okay? And so the fundamental relationship that lambda times nu, the, the frequency, right, is equal to the speed, wave speed, is going to hold always, okay? But what if the source moves toward the receiver, right? That's what I've drawn over here. So now the, the receiver, who's stationary, just like he was here, but the source is moving. First it's here, shoots out a wave. That's this outer wave front that you see there, right? That comes from this point here. Then it shoots out another wave, right? Where the, the distance between these points is just the period, t, which is proportional to 1 over u naught, right? So this distance that I'm drawing here is just the period, right? Where 1 over t equals nu naught, okay? But you see, the receiver is going to see a much shorter wavelength if the source is moving towards it. Do you see that? Yeah. So when it was located here, it emitted a wave, okay? And at a later time, this time here, or actually this time here, right? I have to draw one more dot on it. It's about to emit another wave, okay? So let me mark that as an X. X marks the spot, okay? That's our current position, okay, of the source. But in the past, it was here, and it emitted a wave, and by the time it gets to this point here, this is the wave front. You see? It's just arriving at the receiver now, okay? And then it moves to this point here, back in time, right? And emits another wave. That's this wave front here. This is the wave front as it exists once the source is at this location, X, okay? And then finally, it emits uh, one more wave. And by the time it gets to this point here, this is the wave front, you see? And it's about to emit another wave right there. So the distance between each of these points is period, T, and the period tells you how often you emit a wave, okay? So that's what's going on. And you can see that geometrically, just by drawing these pictures, right, you can see that the wavelength is going to appear shorter to this receiver. Whereas if there was a receiver in the back, you can see the wavelength is getting longer. This is what the wavelength used to be. So let me draw in the receivers at the back, who this is where will be receding in this case. In this case, it's stationary, so it doesn't really matter. And I'll give them a little hat. So the receiver in the back and the receiver in the front sees the same wavelength and consequently the same frequency if the source is not moving. If the source is moving, however, the receiver in the front is going to see a shorter wavelength. Okay. Consequently, the period will appear shorter as well. You get that? Not the period, the, uh, the frequency, right? Yeah. See a higher frequency and a shorter wavelength, okay? The receiver at the, at the back side of this, the one for which the source is receding away from or moving away from, right, is going to see longer wavelengths and smaller uh, frequencies, okay? okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so, you know, can we, can we possibly derive this situation? Um, the answer is yes, but let's take a look at just kind of a, a moment. So if this is, let's call this distance here, this is the source moving from one point to another, and it's moving at some velocity, we'll call it u, time, the t, right? Remember I said that we're going to, each of these points corresponds to one period of oscillation, right? So every time we write one of these points, it's emitting another wave front, okay? So this is, this time is actually the period t, okay? Now, at this point here, it emitted a wave front. And that wave front, let's say, arrives over here at our receiver. Right? Here's our receiver guy. And this is a wave traveling at the speed c. So c times t is the time it takes to arrive at this receiver. Okay? Now, this is, remember, at this point, it's going to start emitting a new wave front. Right? 
So the wavelength is really, it's this distance here, right? Call this lambda prime, where the prime just means that we're looking for this kind of modified wavelength or the Doppler shift, shifted wavelength, okay? So we can easily algebraically see what lambda prime is going to be, right? Okay, so we can write this observed wavelength, we'll call it lambda prime, as being equal to ct minus ut. We can factor out the t, c minus u, okay? But what is t? That's the, the period, right, of the oscillation. 1 over t is equal to nu naught, which means that t would be equal to 1 over nu naught. So I can rewrite this as lambda prime equals 1 over nu naught times c minus u. But nu naught is just equal to uh, well, excuse me, uh, 1 over nu naught would be equal to lambda naught over c, right? I just solve, move the, the nu naught over here, divide out by c, right? Do you see that? So this says that 1 over nu naught is equal to lambda naught over c. That implies that this lambda prime will then be equal to uh, lambda naught over c times c minus u. But I can divide this c into both of these terms, right? If I do that, it turns this into a 1. It turns this into minus u over c, minus u over c, okay? So that would be for approaching, right? If we had looked at this observer, this negative sign would have changed to a positive sign, okay? Because the wavelength is getting longer, right? So the situation would be set up differently. It would be ct plus ut would be the new observed wavelength, okay? And so this negative sign would become positive. But let's write down, uh, well, actually, we want the frequency, so let's hold off for a second because... The speed of these waves is constant, right? It's dependent on the medium, okay? Which means that lambda prime times nu prime has to also be equal to c, okay? Which means that nu prime is equal to c divided by lambda prime. So nu prime is equal to c divided by lambda prime, which is just lambda naught, 1 minus u over c, right? But c over lambda naught, Right, what is that? C over lambda naught is just nu naught. So this is just equal to nu naught times, or divided by 1 minus u over c. Okay? I'm going to write that a little bit differently. I want to preserve it, put it over here. Save. I'm going to write nu prime, uh, excuse me, nu prime source. So this is for a moving source, is equal to nu naught times 1 minus u over c to the minus 1 power, okay? And you'll see why I wrote it that way in a minute. Um, but remember that if it was, if we were talking about this observer, so it was a receding source moving away from us, right, then this would become positive. So I'm going to write it as plus minus, where the one on the top means approaching, the source is approaching you, and the one on the bottom means the source is receding away from you, okay? So... Each of you have actually experienced this change in the frequency for sound, right? Anytime you hear a car approaching you, right, its frequency is higher than it normally is. So as it passes you, it then starts to get lower, right? It's that sound when cars drive by, okay? Yes. You familiar with that sound? Yes. yes. Think of like cars on a racetrack where you have the, the guy at the finish line who's videoing all the cars driving through, right? As they drive by, they go from high frequency to low frequency. That is just the Doppler effect, right, or the Doppler shift um, for sound waves, okay? So as it's approaching you, the frequency is higher, okay? And when it's moving away from you, the frequency is lower than it normally is, okay? This is not hard to derive, but it's kind of hard to think about and figure out on your own. Uh, I think this picture here is essential, right, for starting it out, right? Just the idea that if you imagine it moving, plotting two points for the source, right, each one of those points, it's emitting a wave, right? So the distance between those two points is the speed of the object, the speed of the source, times the period of the wave. That's an important. That's why I wrote the T as an uppercase T, because we usually use uppercase T for period, okay? Um, and then, then it becomes pretty clear what you have to do, okay? Any questions about this so far? Does it make sense? I mean, graphically, it's easy to see, right? I just simply just draw concentric circles uh, increasing in size, right? Yeah. And so the way that I actually constructed this, that may be instructive. 
right, is I took a pen, I marked out my wavelength on the pen on this string, right? That's one wavelength, that's two wavelengths, that's three wavelengths, right? And so for this first circle, I said, okay, well, the time that I'm going to consider, which is way over here, right, the wave is going to have propagated out quite a bit. So we need one, two, three waves. So I'll use my biggest wave to start with, and I draw that circle, okay? And then for this next point, right, which is another point where it'll emit a wave, but it's not going to get as far as this first wave, right, because it's not traveling as long, right? The, the time, the distance in time from here to here is shorter than from here to here, right? So I'm going to use the second wave. So I go to my second wavelength marker on here. I center it at this point here, and I draw a circle. That's this wave front you see here. And then for this final point that I'm going to draw a wave front for, right, I'm going to use the, the first wavelength that I marked off on here. I'll place it here, and I'll make my circle, you see? And so you get these wave fronts that are much closer together than they are when you draw the same thing for a non-moving source. See, here the source was the same. Here's the last wave front to be emitted. Here's the second to the last wave front to be emitted. And here is the third last wave front to be emitted. You see? Yeah. Make sense? So geometrically, you can see what's going on, right? These wavelengths, the, the distance between from peak to peak, right, appears to be much shorter than it would if the source wasn't moving, okay? And then it's just a simple matter of algebra, fleshing that out, okay? Yeah? yeah. And then the other relationship, you must realize that the, the speed of the wave is a constant, right? So the fact that the speed of light is a constant shouldn't be all that peculiar to us uh, because... This is just a general property of waves, right? Wave speed is always constant relative to the medium. Now, with light, you have this problem of, well, what's the medium? Well, vacuum, right? They had this, this, these ideas about an ether, right? Which everything moves through, and they look for this ether, and they never found it. Uh, so, and that's what gave rise to all the funny effects in special relativity, right? It was a consequence of this constancy of the speed of light, regardless of the reference frame, because they're both moving with respect to the, the, uh, the ether, uh, the, uh, with respect to vacuum. Uh, the same, right? Because there is no ether, okay? Um, yeah. So let's hold on to this effect for a second. There's one other thing that we could consider, right? Which would be, imagine, so let's ignore this picture for a moment. Let's go to this picture. Imagine that this stationary source and this stationary observer, imagine the observer starts to walk towards the source now. So now it's the, the observer that's moving, okay? okay? Now, the wavelength that observer is going to see will be the same wavelength as the source emits. Okay? You can see that just from the picture, right? You, there's nothing funny going on. You're just walking this way, right? Yeah. So, in this case, let's see a little pin. Lambda prime is just equal to lambda naught. That doesn't change. Okay? But is the frequency the same? What do you think? This observer is now moving at some constant velocity towards the source. The frequency is not the same. It's not the same. The wavelength is the same, right? If he looks down, he's measuring the wavelength as he passes by. It, it's the same wavelength that the source uh, is emitting, okay? Um, it wasn't here because in the time between the next wave pulse or, or, you know, peak of the wave, the source moves closer to the last wave front that it emitted, right? Thereby reducing the wavelength, right? Or farther away from these wavelengths behind him, right? These way the peaks behind it. But in this case, if you're moving towards it, right, the wavelength is just the wavelength. Nothing changes there. But the frequency is different. So how can we think about it? Well, if he wasn't moving at all, how can we figure out how many wave peaks he sees? There's like some number of wave peaks, right? Call it, uh, so we'll say, I don't know, this, what did I use? U over here? We'll use U over here as well. U equals zero. If he's not moving, right, then the number of wave peaks that he sees equal to uh, the frequency, right, because that tells you how many waves per second are emitted, yes, yeah. times how long is he going to observe for, some t, right? So if you observe for one period, you'll see one wave, right? Nu naught uh, times some, I'll just write it as a delta t, okay, delta t. Not a, there's nothing particular about this delta t. Here the time, I wanted to make sure that it's, we're tracking it in terms of the period, right? Uh, that way we can draw the wave fronts as we did. Here, it's just some arbitrary delta t. If this happens to be one period, we'll see one wave, right? The number of waves seen is one. If you observe for two periods, then it'll be bigger. Um, but nu naught, right, we can write as uh, c over lambda naught, right? So this is also equal to c over lambda naught times delta t, okay? So what happens if he now begins to move, and so u is no longer zero, right? So if his 
speed is no longer zero. Now he's going to encounter, encounter more wave fronts during that time period, right? Because he's walking towards it, right? So he's getting closer to the next wave because he's moving. You see what's happening here is the number of waves is increasing. So let's think about this C over lambda naught times delta T. Let's write it like this. C prime times delta T over lambda naught. Well, what is C prime? That's this new speed, right? The wave speed is changing because he's moving towards the wave, right? Now granted, light is different, and we'll get to that in a minute. But for sound waves, right, if, if sound is coming at me at 340 meters per second, and I'm running towards it at, say, 100 meters per second, right, what has happened is, from my point of view, right, from my reference frame, is the sound traveling slower or faster? Faster. Faster. I'm getting to it quicker, right? So it's like two cars approaching each other, right? Two cars going 20 miles per hour, if they are going in opposite directions, that's a, that's a head-on collision that's the same as if one car was only moving 40 miles per hour and the other one was stationary, right? So, so what's going to happen here is this C prime, right, this kind of new wave speed, is really the old wave speed C plus U, the speed of the, the, the observer, all divided by lambda naught, all times delta T. And, of course, number of waves divided by time, right, what is that? Well, let's actually let's move the lambda naught over here. Here's what we want. Over lambda naught. Lambda naught is just equal to C over nu naught, right? C over nu naught. So I can... C over nu naught, that gives me nu naught over C times C plus U. I'm missing a delta T here, aren't I? Yes, I am. And I still have my delta T. But the number of waves divided by the time that it took to get those waves, what is that? That's just the frequency, right? So I can write this as, I'll just write it over here, nu prime, right? This is N divided by this delta T, right? This is our new frequency. This is the, the observed frequency, right? Uh, and that's going to be equal to new naught. I'm going to divide the C into C plus U here, right? So that's 1 plus U over C. Make sense? Just divided the 1 over C into these two terms. Yes? Took the delta T here, divided it into N. Okay? That is like the definition of frequency, number of waves, divided by the time it took to see those waves. Yeah? Um... And so let me write this result down, because this is different, right? This is for the observer moving. I'm going to write nu prime observer is equal to nu naught times 1. And this time, if this was approaching, if I was receding, if I was running away from the source, this sign would flip. So it would be plus minus. So I'm going to write this as plus minus u over c. Before, it was 1 over this quantity. Now it's just times this quantity. You see that? So that offers an interesting interesting scenario, okay? Because it would seem that we can distinguish between absolute motion, okay? We, we can tell who's the so who's moving, the source or the observer, right? Because they have different forms. And so to kind of flesh this out, let me just do the following. Uh, for starters, everyone understand how I got to this point, right? This might have been a little tricky for you. N divided by delta T, that's just the, the observed frequency, right? So if, let's say I observed Two waves over a time period of two seconds. What's the frequency? Well, it's two waves divided by two seconds. That's one wave per second, or one hertz, right? So that's all this is here, okay? Yeah? <clears throat> and if you think about this relationship up here, right, since lambda prime is the same as lambda naught, right, what this makes it look like is happening, it makes it look like the wave speed is changing because I'm moving with respect to it. The same thing would happen if the wind was blowing, okay? If instead of saying the observer is walking towards the, the source, if we said the wind is blowing towards the observer, and the observer is standing still, they still have this relative velocity between the wave and the observer, you see? Yeah. And so this would also be the kind of effect that you'd get if the wind speed, if the wind changed. Okay, this is something you don't see in special relativity, right? Because there's no ether wind. Um, but that, that's what's going on here, okay? It's a kind of a change in the perceived speed of the wave because the medium is moving towards you, either because you're running through the medium or because the medium is moving, i.e. wind, okay? Here are the two results, though. Um, who remembers the, uh, the binomial theorem, just out of curiosity? Uh, I'm going to write it down real quickly. That, say 1 plus x to the n power, right, is equal to 1 uh, plus n times x. Uh, plus n 
times n minus 1 over 2 uh, times x squared, right? Yeah. Um, plus dot, 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 right? This goes on forever, right? It's an approximation. If we truncate it, it's an approximation. If we add an infinite number of terms, then we get the exact answer. If only you have the time to add that many terms. This is really n choose k, right, this term here, right, where k refers to the number of terms that we have, right, or expand out to. Uh, and n is the order of the exponent here, right, to the power, right? So we have this. We can use this to expand this source, right? Remember, so we wrote that nu prime source was equal to nu naught times 1 minus or plus u over c to the minus 1 power, okay? So I'm going to expand this. I'm going to let n be equal to minus 1, okay? And I'm, I'm going to write it like this, and you'll see why in a second. Um, so we have nu naught times, and then we'll let x be equal to, let's just consider the case of uh, approaching, right? So that would be negative would be 1 minus u over c for the source. It would be 1 plus u over c for the observer moving, okay? So it's the top of the plus minus or minus plus, okay? So we get 1 plus n. n is minus 1, so that's uh, plus minus 1 times x. But x is going to be minus u over c, okay? Minus u over c. And then let's just take it out to the, the second, to the, to the quadratic term, okay? So this will be... Um, Plus n, again, is minus 1 times mi n minus 1. What's well, minus 1 minus 1? It's minus 2. So that's minus 2 divided by 2 uh, times x squared. Well, when we square minus u over c, we get u squared over c squared. Okay? Yes? Yeah. Let's fix the signs now. Okay, so minus times minus is positive. So we can get rid of that. We can just call this plus u over c. Okay? Um, is that right? Yeah, I think it's fine. Um, and here, minus 1 times minus 2 is positive 2. Divided by 2 is just 1, so we can get rid of that. Yes? Yeah. Now, I want to, and we'll say approximately, so I'll change equals to approximately. So I'm going to stop at this number of terms, but I want to subtract off this v observe, uh, v observer, or new prime observer. Okay? Taking the difference between the source, moving source, and the moving observer measurements, okay? So subtracting that off, this, both of them have the new naught in it, and this will be minus 1 times new naught, uh, plus, but minus a plus is minus u over c. Okay? So look at this. We got 1 minus 1, so that goes away. Yes? We have u over c minus u over c, so that goes away. Yes? And we're just left with this one term, right? So this delta nu, if you will, is approximately mu naught times u squared over c squared, okay? Which means that if you can measure the, the frequency, right, to smaller than this value here, then you can determine which one is moving and which one is not. So you, you have a way to find absolute motion. So let's say we're now talking about light waves, okay? That's a problem, okay? Because that violates the principle of relativity. There is only relative velocity in as it turns out, as Einstein showed. And so this, applied to light waves, would uh, violate the principle of relativity because you would be able to discern who was moving and who was not moving. Okay? okay? So how does relativity fix this? So something must not quite be right about these equations if we're considering it for light. Okay? So what are the modifications that special relativity has to make? That's the question. Okay? okay. So let's see. We've done special relativity before. Um, Am I done with these pictures? I think I am. I hope I am, because they're a pain to draw. Yeah, I'm done with them. Don't need them anymore. Because when it comes to special relativity, what do we draw? You guys remember what we draw? We have to draw space-time diagrams. Where this is time, this is space, when we call it x, I call it x, okay? We want to draw, normally we draw light lines, okay? And I will draw a light line right here. Okay? That looks like 45 degrees, right? And what does that line says? What, what does that line say? That says that x equals t, yes? This is the speed of light, yes? If I, now remember, it doesn't matter in relativity because all motion is relative. It doesn't matter whether the source is moving or the observer is moving, right? That's the assumption. Right, so we can make either one do it. So we'll make the source of this be in the stationary frame, what we're calling a platform frame. Remember that? 
and we'll say this is the wavelength. Here's one wavelength, here's two wavelengths, okay? So as this as light travels forward in time from this point here, right? What does this point look like? I'm trying to draw this as parallel as I can. This is not x equals t, this is x equals t plus, and we'll call this distance here lambda. It's the wavelength, okay? So here we have x equals t plus lambda. If we want to add another one in, we could draw that light line, and that would be x equals t plus 2 lambda, okay? We don't need it, though, okay? Now, this is our platform frame. We're emitting radiation. This is its wavelength as measured at the platform. Let's get a train to zip by and see how it perceives that, okay? And remember what we do for that, right? We need to draw these new axes that are symmetrical. That's terrible. That are symmetrical about this light line, right? This is our T prime axis, right? But this is really the line X equals V times T, right? This is like where T prime is equal to zero. That's what this line here is, right? This is the T prime equals zero line. Um, excuse me. That's not correct. This is the X prime equals zero line, right? This is like the guy standing in whatever position he's in that we're calling the origin. This is where the clock synchronized, right? Yeah. When they pass each other, right? So maybe it's the guy in the caboose. Maybe it's the guy in the engine. Who knows? Whichever you choose. Um, but X is equal to V times T. And don't forget that the speed of light C is just one here, okay? And we'll do it that way because it makes it less complicated. What about this guy's X prime axis? What does it look like? Well, it's symmetrical, right? What if this angle to the light line is, you make the same angle in this direction, and hopefully that's not a horrible looking line, and we get this line which says that T is equal to V times X. And if this really bothers you to say that T is equal to a velocity times a distance, then don't forget that you know you need there are C squareds in here that need to be accounted for to make the units work out. It's just because we said C is equal to 1 that we write it this way, okay? And it bothers us a little bit when we see it. This one doesn't bother us because we normally think of distance as a velocity times time, but never do we think of time as a velocity times distance, right? Yeah. Something's off there. It's because of the C equals 1. Um, but anyhow, let's start with X equals t plus lambda. That's this line here. Oh, sorry. This line here. Yes? Yeah. Well, t, what is t equal to? t is equal to v times x. So this is just v times x plus lambda. We've got an x and an x. Let's put them together, right? So that gives me that x times 1 minus v, I just moved this over to this side, right, is equal to lambda. So let me solve for x. That means that x is equal to lambda divided by 1 minus v. Yes? Yeah. So if I'm going to write down a coordinate, right, for this, I need to write down, remember we always write the time first and then the spatial coordinate when we do uh, relativity? So the coordinate, right, the, the t comma x coordinate is going to be, well, t, what is t? Well, t is just v times x. I already have x, so I multiply this times the velocity, so I get v lambda over 1 minus v, and the x, the position x, right, is given by um, just lambda over 1 minus v, okay? So that's our that's the event that we're interested in, and we would like to know what are the coordinates for that event in the moving frame, right? The primed frame. And so I have to use the Lorentz transformations, right? Do you remember them? Probably not. T prime is going to be equal to gamma times T minus V times X, right? And X prime will be equal to gamma times x minus v times t. There's this nice symmetry in the Lorentz transformations, especially when you write it with c equals to 1. Okay? okay. And gamma, of course, you remember gamma? Gamma is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared. Whereas if we, if we were going to do... Uh, it, it's a unitless parameter, right? Because if we put the speed of light back in, this would become 1 minus v squared over c squared. The units cancel out, so it's a unitless parameter, okay? Ah, so we just need to transform these two equations here, right? So what can we do? The x prime that I'm interested in, right, is really what I'm going to call lambda prime, right? I'm going to call this distance here, from here to here, this is my event, this is the distance lambda prime, okay? That's the wavelength that I observe on the train, okay? So I'm going to rewrite x prime as lambda prime, so I'm going to say lambda prime, equal to gamma times x. Well, what is x? 
x is lambda over 1 minus v. All right? Minus um, v times t. Well, what is t? That's v over v times lambda over 1 minus v. So I'm going to get a v squared, another lambda over another 1 minus v. Let's go ahead and factor out the 1 minus v. Give me gamma over 1 minus v. I can also factor out a lambda. All right? That gives me 1 minus v squared. That looks promising, right? Because what is 1 minus v squared? We think algebraically, well, 1 is a square number. 1 squared is 1. v squared is a square number because v squared is v squared, right? So I can rewrite 1 minus v squared as 1 plus v times 1 minus v. Do you see why I want to do that? Right? Yeah. It's going to be convenient, right? So if I write this using the difference of two squares, I get gamma lambda uh, 1 minus v times 1 Actually, I'm going to write 1 plus v times 1 minus v um, over 1 minus v right, from before. Those two cancel, and I'm conveniently left with this. But that's not all. I still have the gamma, right? So it, it's kind of messy, but it will be useful to go ahead and put the gamma in now. Remember, this is gamma. So I'm going to write this as lambda times the square root. What am I going to do? I'm going to square this thing and put it inside the square root, right? Because if I do 1 plus v squared, right, that's equal to 1 plus v if I take the square root, right? Yeah. So I can put it in the square root, and I'm going to write like this, 1 plus v times 1 plus v, yes? Yeah. Divided by 1 minus v squared. Well, we already know we can write 1 minus v squared using the uh, difference of two squares. That's from the gamma, right? I can write that as 1 plus v times 1 minus v, yes? Yeah. Which means that this cancels, right? And I'm just left with, what do I want to write? I'll write it over here. I'll write, uh, well, we, we still need something. Lambda prime is equal to lambda times the square root of 1 plus v divided by 1 minus v. But remember that there's the relationship lambda prime times nu prime is equal to 1. 1 is the speed of light, remember, right? Which means that nu prime is just equal to 1 over lambda prime, which means that Relativity tells us that nu prime for both observer and source, right, is equal to. Um, I do that. I have a one over lambda, which I can write as. We also. Have, well, I'm just going to write as lambda. We also have lambda nu equals one. That's in the platform frame. Yes. Yeah. And so, when I substitute this in, uh, I lost. Where did he go? Here it is. Right. I'm going to get. Uh, let me just do it down here real quick so you can get the algebra right. I want to get nu, nu prime, 1 over lambda prime, so that'll be 1 over lambda times, we just have to take the reciprocal of this, right? Because 1 over this is the reciprocal of this, so this is going to be 1 minus nu, uh, v over 1 plus v. But 1 over lambda, right, from this relationship here, is just equal to nu. Nu times 1 minus v over 1 plus v, and I apologize that my nu's look like my v's. I should have used something other than v. Um, <clears throat> for the velocity, I should have used u or something. But actually, we used u here. Why did I use v here? It's dumb. I mean, I'm going to use u when I write it up here. Nu prime is going to be equal to nu, that's the frequency in the platform frame, right, times the square root of 1 minus u divided by 1 plus u. Turns out you can't determine an absolute motion because the correct Doppler shift is this. Okay, this is the one that we'll use later when we talk about the Doppler shift from galaxies moving away from us. Right, this is something we can measure. Okay, if you want to change uh, whether it's receding or approaching, right, you can always just flip the velocity right here. Okay, we'll change the sign in front of you, and that will give you uh, receding instead of approaching. So if we want to look at galaxies moving away, we change the signs in this to account for the fact that they're receding away from us, okay? So we can see what they call the red shift. But we'll talk about that much later. Um, so that's the relativistic Doppler shift. Which was harder to come up with, the relativistic Doppler shift or the regular Doppler shift? Yeah, actually, I found it more difficult to come up with a regular Doppler shift, whereas this is pretty straightforward, right, to come up with. If you just, you know, the special relativity, you just hammer it out and... It's always these pictures, and you draw. If you draw the right picture, you can solve the problem. Okay. So, now, uh, last thing I want to mention, though,
there's one more effect that I wanted to mention. Uh, I'm not going to draw the careful picture of it. But imagine that the source is moving faster than this, the wave speed of the material. Right? This makes perfect sense to do, say, uh, with a sound wave. Right? If I can get a jet plane to fly faster than the speed of sound, right? then I can be in this regime where the source is moving faster. I shouldn't have erased that, but that's fine. Uh, the source is moving faster than the wave speed of the material. Right? And so phenomenologically, we can think about what happens. Right? There's not going to be any wave fronts in front of the, the moving source. Right? Because it's traveling faster than the wave is. So it emits a sound wave, but it's traveling faster than the sound wave, so it's getting out in front of it, right? Yeah. So there's no sound. So if you if there was a plane approaching you and it was traveling faster than the speed of sound, would you hear it before it passed you? No, it'd be totally silent, right? It's it's eerie. Uh, I actually remember uh, when I was much, much younger uh, in the Navy doing some drills and exercises with planes, and this plane uh, came off the horizon. Uh, barely 200 feet off the deck, something like that, really, really low, close to the ocean, and flew over our ship. Uh, and you didn't hear it until it passed, right? And then you got the, the sonic boom, and then, but uh, yeah, it's totally no noise at all. Just, oh, right? It's crazy. But uh, so what is the, and it, in light, there is an effect in light. So if I put, speed of light is a is, uh, constant, right? And you can't travel faster than the speed of light, but in a refractive material, light actually slows down. Right? It's a little bit complicated, uh, but you can say that we can treat it as if light slows down and travels slower in this material uh, than it does in vacuum, and I can actually shoot charged particles over a refracted material, generating electromagnetic waves in the refracted material where the charged particle is zipping by faster than the wave is moving forward, and you get something called a Jankoff cone. Okay, and um, it's Basically, the way that you picture it, if this is my source moving with some speed v, I imagine that this, the waves kind of pile up. I don't know if that's right or not, but, and you get this, uh, this Cherenkov cone, right? You see the cone? I've kind of drawn the cone like this. This is where the wave fronts are piling up at, okay? And let's say I consider two points. This is where it was. This is where it is now. And so this distance here. Right is going to be the u times uh, just a delta t. I'll call it delta t. Let me just make a little space here to write. So this distance is u times delta t. Okay, but think you draw drop a perpendicular from this like hypothetical cone, right, where the wave fronts are piling up at to this point here. So that is a perpendicular. Yes, and the distance from this point here to some point here is C delta T, right? That's the wave speed, okay? And so this angle, which I have not left a lot of room to show, this angle, we'll call it theta, right? It's given by the relationship that the sine of theta, right? Here's my hypotenuse, so that helps me figure out where, uh, excuse me, there's my right angle, so I know that this is my hypotenuse, right? So that gives me this is equal to C delta T, the opposite, over the hypotenuse, U delta T. It's the same delta T, so, I can do that. Now remember, the source is moving faster, right, than the wave speed. If the source was slow, this would not work. There's no cone, right? You can't have a sign that's bigger than one, right? But since the wave speed u is bigger than the, excuse me, since the the source u is faster than the wave speed c, this is always smaller than one, right? So this angle you can calculate. It's the Cherenkov cone angle, okay? Um, and one of the reasons I brought it up is because some of my own research from long ago was actually in demonstrating uh, what's called a negative uh, Cherenkov cone. Um, it's the Cherenkov cone that you would encounter in a negative refractive index material. You might remember when we talked about optics, I mentioned that I had done some work on the theory behind this idea of negative refraction. Um, and uh, the main stuff that I did was really considering a particular type of material, a combination of ferroelectric and a ferromagnetic material that might give rise to this negative refractive index behavior in the terahertz frequency regime of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and so I did uh, wrote a simulation and simulated this. And in that simulation, we see what the negative Cherenkov cone looks like. And it's pretty odd. Uh, you can see it playing here, hopefully. Um, so it's kind of like the backwards version of a Cherenkov cone. It's a little bit weird, right? Yeah. And that's it. That's it for waves. The, our, our, 
foundation waves will hopefully prove useful in the, uh, the next semester when we talk about uh, electricity and magnetism. We'll do some light and optics, uh, and we'll probably, hopefully, get to talk a little bit about quantum mechanics, because quantum mechanics needs waves. Okay? All right, that's all I got for you. Oh, now you smile. How does that help you?